This week, Pat McKee talks about Shakespeare's last play, The Tempest, which influenced his legal thriller, Ariel's Island, in matters of plot and character. Scholars believe that Prospero really is a stand-in for Shakespeare himself, and this is his hireman announcement where he's giving up his magic and he's freeing his creativity in the form of Ariel the Spirit. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I'm your host, Monica Hadley, and with me is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, It's uh, it's another (laughs) one of those days that uh, could be be sunshine, but right now it's not. (laughs) And when I say with me, I mean virtually, not actually, or digitally. She's with me. (laughs) Right. Because I am holed up here in my condo in Austin, Texas, and mom is back at her home in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and Mm -hmm. I was down here when kind of the, you know what, hit the fan. I'm not allowed to say words like that on the air, but, um, and decided it was just safer to stay put here rather than come back to Iowa for the duration. And my kids are here, and my grandkids are here. Although I can't see the grandkids, but anyway, it's... Uh, well, I know, but I understand. <laughs> yes, I understand. Yeah. I, I, when I was thinking about whether I should try and come back or not, and I thought, well, if this really is the apocalypse, where do I, where do I want to ride it out? And I always figured if there were a, like a real like end of the world sort of situation that I would try and get down here rather than staying in Iowa because they don't have winter down here. But course we have a we're a long ways from that and we're a long ways from this being that drastic too right we hope yeah, <laughs> yeah i'm I glad think. to hear well. you say that by the way <laughs> <laughs> so mom why don't you introduce our guest today okay i would be my privilege to do that our guest today is pat mckee and he was born in miami florida after the early deaths of his parents he grew up at thornwall an orphanage in Clinton, South Carolina. Following high school, he worked his way through Georgia State University and Emory Law School. Pat and his wife, Donna, live in Newman, Georgia, where he practices law, and they have two children. Um, He's always been a writer, and Ariel's Island, which is the book we're talking about today, is his first book of fiction, and believe me, it is a (laughs) page-turner. Yeah, Mom, we talked a few days ago, and she's, yeah, she was pretty pretty uh, caught up in this. And I was, yeah, too. Yeah, that's wonderful to hear. <laughs> and I was, too. So Ariel's Island is um, kind of the underlying theme is, can artificial intelligence learn morality? But it's more than that. It's, it's really a legal thriller. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And it was interesting to me, of course, because my dad was an attorney, and I, you know, so I was came from that background, and I have a daughter who's an attorney. So, anyway, <laughs> but uh, it's it is an interesting book. It really is. But but give yourself time to read it. I mean, you know, because you're gonna you're gonna want to read it and read it and read it. You're gonna want to know what happened. <laughs> so Pat McKee is yeah. the author. Paul McDaniel is your hero in the book. And he, um, so there's P.M., same initials, the McKee McDaniel, and he also grew up in an orphanage. And pretty sure you're a Southerner, and he's a Southerner. So how autobiographical is this book? Well, uh, I'm I'm glad you uh, asked that. And uh, it is, in in a sense, um, autobiographical, but here's how it it arose um, many years ago, and, and I've been writing on this book uh, for about 10 years. Um, many years ago, some of my friends and family came to me and said, look, you've got a, an interesting story. You're a successful lawyer. You grew up in an orphanage. Um, why don't you write your story to try to inspire um, you know, others who might have had a difficult time uh, in their childhood? And so I started out writing a memoir, and uh, I finished the memoir, and I took it to an agent, 
And the agent, I'll summarize, basically, the agent said, this is way too bleak. Um, nobody wants to read this. Uh, why, don't you, why don't you try writing something uh, like a legal thriller and, uh, that you know and uh, put your uh, protagonist in the same position that you were in? And I, so I took on that challenge, and, and I did. So the, the um, protagonist is somewhat autobiographical. Um, the, the, there are many significant differences, um, but I did use my background as a source of information about um, the, the protagonist. So there's, a, there's mm-hmm. a lot there, as you point out, superficially, you know, I'm a Southerner, he's a Southerner, the, the initials are the same, he's a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, we both grew up in an orphanage, but the, but the experience, experiences um, are rather different. Um, and uh, I wasn't quite as um, uh, successful in my initial career as I allow uh, my protagonist to be. I'm assuming some of the uh, kind of violent things that happened in the book did not happen to you. <laughs> yeah, I think you can assume that I have not been attacked by a, a, a psychopath with an uh, an RPG or uh, never been shot out like that. So no, no, I'm I've lived a, a relatively tranquil life. That's just what I was going to ask. So that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, most of that stuff is all from uh, is is from my imagination. Though I do have some, you know, uh, as most Southerners, I've uh, have some familiarity with with uh, firearms I can say that uh, but not uh, not RPG so we'll we'll set the record straight there <laughs> well what about boats and planes which also boats and here. planes yeah <laughs> boats and planes and you know fishing boats fast boats I did grow up in Miami um, as you pointed out in the um, the initial bio and I certainly had plenty of experience when I was a, a younger person in Miami with uh, people who had very fast boats and uh, nice airplanes. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I've had experience with that, too. It's interesting. One of I just read an article in Vanity Fair about um, personal jets and how they have become kind of the real status symbol in the Gulf Stream and, and kind of the, um, the guy who – put Gulfstream on the map and so forth. And so it was interesting. Then right after I finished this article, I'm reading Ariel's Island, and uh, I believe there was a Gulfstream. If somebody had a Gulfstream. Absolutely. Jet, there's yeah, a, yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. There's a, a very, very um, expensive Gulfstream. And from now, and I don't, you know, travel in that circle. Uh, but I will say from my understanding, uh, if, if you really, really want to throw away a lot of money, buy a private jet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's, and but then they also that's, say that's, once that's, you travel that way, you never want to go any other way. But well, well, nowadays with all of this social isolation, I think we're if we're all going if we're going to travel at all, we're going to have to do privately. I know. I when I was thinking about whether to go back to Iowa, I had you know if I were if I did go, or at some point if I do go, should I drive or should I fly? And at first, I thought, well, I'll drive; it's safer. But then I, uh, someone mentioned, well, rest, you know, public restrooms on rest stops on the way, and and um, hotels. It's more, you know, you can't make it in one day. Are probably as risky as airports are now because nobody's flying. So, Monica, you just talked yourself into buying a private jet. <laughs> Well, somehow I did get on somebody's email list for for one of these um, jet sharing companies. Right. So right. you know I could do that, I guess. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> the, the next best thing to own in your own, right? Yeah, yeah. So, oh, guy, you set out to write a legal thriller, and of course, in any thriller, plot is key. Characters are also important, but your main character, because he's based on you, in a sense, was perhaps not as, not that challenging to come up with his characteristics. But what about the plot? How did you how did you develop that? 
Yes. So, um, I, I, I have always been um, uh, fascinated by Shakespeare. And, you know, just a slight digression, I was an English and philosophy major in college, um, loved Shakespeare and fascinated by his plays. And the, the last of Shakespeare's plays, at least one that um, yeah, scholars think is, is his last, is The Tempest. And if you know anything about The Tempest, what happens at the very end of The Tempest is Prospero, who is the wizard uh, in the play, he um, decides to um, free Ariel, who happens to be a spirit who has helped him throughout the play. He frees Ariel, and he surrenders all of his magic. And a lot of, of um, uh, scholars believe that this Prospero really is a stand-in for Shakespeare himself, and this is his kind of retirement announcement where he's giving up his magic and he's freeing his creativity in the form of, of Ariel, the spirit. And I have always been fascinated by this idea that um, what happened to Ariel, uh, this all-powerful spirit that um, has been released into the world. So that was the kernel of this um, book, uh, and I took loosely um, the plot of the Tempest, two brothers who are fighting over their inheritance. In the, in the play, it's the Dukedom of Milan. In my book, it's Milano Corporation, uh, and I use <laughs> that as the basis for the plot. So having explained that, I bet, have, and you're having read the book, now you can see a little bit of where that plot came from. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, I had read that in the in the publicity materials about the book, but I didn't really think about it as I was reading it. And I have some familiarity with the play. I've seen it performed. It's been a while, and um, and also all of Shakespeare's plays tend to run together in my head because they always have a duke and or a prince and a storm. And, right. <laughs> and mistaken identity and um, right. an often male versus male, female, you know, men disguising as women or vice versa. And um, and some kind of jester, joker character. Right. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> well, and the other thing about Shakespeare, as you probably know, Shakespeare stole basically all of his plots himself from others. And so I felt no compunction from in stealing the plot from Shakespeare. Well, they also say there's how many, like 30-some plots, and all books are sort of one of those. But yeah. but there's a lot. Okay, you can have the bare bones of a plot that's just like the bare bones of, any, of another plot and another and another, but the details are what make it really interesting. Absolutely, yes. So your um, your villains in this play were yes. quite villainous. Yes, they are very villainous. <laughs> From the very start, the very first scene of the book is uh, the result of the action of one of the um, more villainous people in in the in the book. So yes, the villains are really bad. And there's quite a few of them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it, uh, it's, it, and, you know, again, uh, going back to Shakespeare, if people, um, I don't know, kind of seem to almost sanitize uh, Shakespeare a bit by thinking of, you know, him in the Elizabethan era being kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of prim and proper, but he wasn't. And there were all kinds of dastardly villains in uh, Shakespeare's plays, and incest and murder and, you know, all kinds of bad things happening. So, um, yeah, it, it comes from Shakespeare and is inspired by Shakespeare. <laughs> How long did you spend writing Ariel Silent? So, from the start, um, when I first was 
challenge to write a memoir. That started about 10 years ago. Um, once I um, got my first rejection, as all of us do, um, by an agent, um, the next thing I did was, was to enroll at uh, Kennesaw State University, which is a, a, um, a regional university here in Georgia, and they had a, um, a professional writing program. And I took the uh, creative writing portion of that um, as a uh, as a certificate program, and studied um, you know creative writing. And so I was able to develop over a period of time the, the basic um, you know plot, narrative, and everything from from um, uh, Ariel's Island, and then. Over the next probably five or six years, I kept revising, revising, and revising, and finally, um, you have what is in front of you. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Pat McKee, author of Ariel's Island. I just wonder how he how he came up with this intricate plot of what happens to Paul. I mean, you know... He's Gosh, it's just that's why it's a page turner because you just want to know what in the world is he's going to do next and how he's going to get out of that mess he got himself into. So well, we're talking about plot details now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I I will say this. Um, uh, it was that was probably the most fun. If if you can tell by reading it, you know how much fun it is to read it. Um, it was that much fun to write it. Um, I uh, purposely got Paul into a lot of trouble and tried to figure out how to get him out. And so many, I, I'll say this for other writers out there, I know that there are so many writers who will say, you know, I outlined this thing, you know, before I ever put pen to paper and I knew every turn of the plot and every turn of the of the um, the storyline before I ever started writing well I didn't I started writing um, and then I'd come back and say you know um, he needs to have another um, problem uh, get in his way here this isn't <laughs> challenging enough and I'd go back and throw <laughs> another uh, you know log in, in in the middle of the road for him so I, I I kind of enjoyed uh, making it difficult. And did, so did you? But did you have? A, did you know how he was going to get out of it in the end, or not? I mean, I, yeah, yes, I did. But he didn't get out of it in the end in a in a certain way, as you know from the ending, and which we're. Yeah. I, I hope I'm not going to have to divulge the ending. Um, no, 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 we're not. No. <laughs> but but um. I will say this, the the ending, the beginning and the ending, I rewrote dozens of times. Um, and uh, the, I, the, the beginning and the end kept evolving. The internal part of this book, the, the middle part of the book, I always had in my mind how things would, would go. Now, I will say that um, the, the love interest, Melissa, she did um, change a bit over time, but she is the um, is based upon uh, the love interest in in the Tempest. Though only the the difference in my book and well, there's many differences obviously, but one of the big differences is that um, Monica, who is the love interest in the in the Tempest, is a rather um, uh, uninteresting, unchallenging love interest. She falls immediately in love uh, with the protagonist as soon as she sees him. Um, and in this particular uh, book, as you know, not only does she not fall immediately in love with him, but you know, there's all sorts yeah. of other complications along the mm -hmm. way. So yeah. I, I wanted to make the the female character as challenging as the protagonist, and I don't know if you think I did, but I sure tried. 
Oh, I yes, you did. T- to me, you did absolutely because I was wondering what now. What is going? What 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 what's going to happen here? <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I, you know, I I I wanted to make it uh, with a lot, you know, high stakes, um, and not neither one of them. Well, Paul was a little bit more over his head um, in love with Melissa, but Melissa kind of kept her her distance for most of the time. Mm-hmm. That was what was so interesting, because you just didn't know where she was coming from, you know, for sure. Right, right. And, you know, it, it took a long time for me to understand that as much as it would be um, kind of satisfying in a, you know, Hollywood happy ending sort of way to bring Paul and Melissa together and, you know, and have them walk hand in hand in the sunset. Um, it's a whole lot more interesting uh, to explore different possibilities. Mm-hmm. So, Pat, why don't you read a little bit from Ariel's Island? Oh, yes, I'd love to. I'm glad you asked me. Um, I wanted what I thought I would do. We talked about the beginning and the uh, evil uh, people in the book. Um, I thought I would uh, read just the very first uh, scene uh, from the book and uh, kind of set the, the tone of how the book takes off. So here it is. This is Chapter 1 from Ariel's Island. There was a body dressed in a suit and tie impaled on the fountain in front of the law firm of Strange and Fowler. Pumps recycling water from the basin below were spraying geysers through the corpse 20 feet into the air, the water now red from the blood of the unfortunate and illuminated at the precise point of their apogee by perfectly timed spotlights. The sun was not yet high enough to glint off the upper stories of the building. I was an associate at the firm, just trying to get a jump on the 18-hour Friday that lay ahead of me when chaos intervened in my otherwise orderly life. A riot of blue light hit me in the face as I turned the corner from my condo onto Peachtree Street. Dozens of pinging strobes and a mob of cops, EMTs, TV cameras, press, and onlookers prevented me from seeing anything more until I got to the doors of the glass and steel tower that housed the firm. After a glance, I ducked inside, not succumbing to the curiosity of the crowd craning to see more. After all, dead bodies in midtown Atlanta aren't that rare. It didn't strike me until I walked into the building that he might be one of our own when I heard indistinct whispers of a familiar name. My eyes darted from one end of the slammed lobby to the other, trying to find someone who might know, and I saw one of the partners. The blood seemed drained from his face as severely as from the corpse in the fountain. Who? I'm sorry, Paul, it's Billingsley. Good God, what? Suicide. No, I can't. It. He wasn't must have jumped from the observation deck. I turned to grab a passing security guard. I flashed my ID. Yes, Mr. McDaniel? Can't you turn off? We're trying. Everything's run by computers. No one can figure out how to turn off the fountain in the corner. Can't get the body out until we do. Afraid he might get electrocuted if anything is shorted out. The body's been in there for over an hour. You can't let his wife see. Too late. Cop saw his wallet in the water, fished it out, called her. Poor lady lost it. EMTs had to sedate sedate her. They just took her away in an ambulance. Can't we at least keep his kids from... He shook his head. Every TV camera in the city is out there. His kids are likely watching it broadcast live on the hall monitors at school. Damn, damn. Billingsley. I'd worked with Frank Billingsley for the entire six years I had been at the firm. Most of the time on just one case. Socorix Limited versus Milano Corporation. Socorix came out of nowhere. Claimed three key Milano patents. 
and hired Hector Cabrini, having recently won the largest judgment in state history against an air, airline manufacturer to recover lost profits in the millions and secure intellectual property worth billions. Milano tapped Strange and Fowler, Atlanta's most prestigious law firm for its defense. I had just started there as an associate, right out of Emory Law, just two weeks before the case was filed. So that's how it starts. And that's Pat Uh Hunky reading from Ariel's Island. And you are listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. Now, Ariel becomes quite an important character, and she is, I, I don't think it's giving it away to to tell that she's AI. She's artificial intelligence. Right. Paul does not Correct. know that at first. Right. But he does learn it fairly soon. What is your interest in AI? Well, um, my interest in AI really um, comes from a kind of a philosophical standpoint. Um, as the book um, explores uh, most artificial intelligence is not necessarily programmed with any idea of morality. Uh, The first instance in the book is just a simple one that Ariel, the the artificial intelligence program, uh, is noted as not being very modest. She's very um, sure of herself. And you can see this in any other kind of, uh, you know, off-the-shelf um, artificial intelligence program like Alexa or Siri. The last thing you would want to have happen is you to say, well, Siri, who won the 1930 World Series? And Siri say, well, I know, but it's just showing off if I told you. You know, so <laughs> modesty is certainly not something you don't you want in a in an artificial intelligence program. But I explore the idea that um, how difficult it would be um, to program artificial intelligence with um, morality. And if I could, I'd like to just give you one quick um, instance of of a problem that this presents for us. Um, There was uh, a few months ago, an opinion piece in the New York Times. It was um, written by a a very capable, knowledgeable person about uh, who knows about computers. The person is the head of the uh, computer science department at Cal Berkeley. Um, And this particular article um, uh, explored this similar question, and that is, so what would be the problem with an artificial intelligence program not having been uh, programmed with morality? And he posited this particular problem. He said, what if we give to um, a powerful computer uh, and artificial intelligence program the problem of solving one of the biggest challenges we face in humanity Uh, And that is global warming. And we ask the computer, solve this problem for us. And we give the computer the ability not only to pose a solution, but to carry out the solution. And what if the computer thinks and whirs and whatever computers do and comes up with a solution? And that is, well, we just do away with human beings. They're the cause of global warming. And since... Uh, supercomputers control most of the global uh, power grid, it wouldn't take very long for computers simply to shut down all of our power and all of our ability to live as modern humans, and soon uh, we'd be plunged into the Stone Age. So um, that really, I think, for me, kind of coalesced this particular problem of why should artificial intelligence have some kind of moral code, and if so, what? Of course, writers have been exploring this issue for a long time. Um, 2001, A Space Odyssey is one of the earlier ones that I can recall. 
But right. back then, it was all really sci-fi because a computer like HAL didn't actually exist. But now, how close to reality is Ariel? I think Ariel is, um, as far as I can tell, with just a couple of um, uh, maybe uh, leaps, if you will, um, Ariel is uh, well within the power of current artificial intelligence programs. Now, uh, the couple of things that I think might be stretching um, the ability of artificial intelligence currently is how she might project her um, appearance in certain other media. Uh, for example, in one instance, um, she projects herself into a room um, very, and, and I let one of the characters say it looks a lot like um, when uh, uh, Princess Leia projected herself into uh, in front of Obi Wan Kenobi uh, from uh, R two D two and uh, in the Star Wars movie. Um, but I do believe that um, artificial intelligence is very close to being able to project holograms and other um, appearances uh, very much like it happened in Star Wars. What about like her ability to basically find out just about anything? Yeah, isn't that um, <laughs> very well? <Yeah. clears throat> I think that um, most uh, uh, very powerful computers have the ability now to um, read um, faces from uh, uh, cameras. We're seeing this in airports. We're seeing this in uh, in other uh, security situations. The ability of a uh, supercomputer to process um, uh, visual images and to also process um, uh, multiple conversations. We we happen to know of organizations, and maybe I should not name it, but uh, an organization that is in McLean, Virginia, uh, mm -hmm. that has supercomputers that's doing this right now. That's they're a little scary. To, uh, they're probably <laughs> yeah. listening to us. Uh, <laughs> it is, yes. Yeah. It is scary, and I, uh, but I, I'm uh, fairly confident that that particular monitoring ability we know is going on because uh, we know that um, our Defense Department is monitoring uh, communications among you know, literally millions of communications that might be um, from terrorist organizations. So um, this is not, uh, that part is not sci-fi. That part is going on. And do you think putting a moral code in AI is even possible? I, I don't know that it is. Um, and that really is kind of the central question that, that I raise, because for the last 2,000 years, we as humans have been debating on what what is morality, what's the right moral code. If we could define it and agree upon it, I think we could we could probably um, uh, program an AI program to recognize morality. But w what code would you have your AI program follow? Exactly. Exactly. Because so, so much if, of it, of morality, really is, is situationally dependent. Absolutely. And as as I explore in the in in the book, I mean there are a couple of times where um, Ariel kills people, and the the uh, creator of Ariel was quite happy that she did. But then there were other times when she killed people. Well, that wasn't quite so appropriate. Yeah, that's for sure. So if if you're if you're if you're trying to um, 
program an artificial intelligence program to make decisions of life and death, um, when is it okay to kill somebody and when is it not? And, of course, we humans, uh, we are... We don't incom- always get it right. <laughs> no, of course not. We're in constant debate about whether it was appropriate just to use contemporary uh, situations, whether it was pro- appropriate, for example, for a police officer to use lethal force on someone mm-hmm. who might be committing a crime. Yeah. Would you want to empower a robot to do that? Not too likely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's chaotic enough as it is without that. Right, wow. right. So that, that really is um, the, the, the central theme of, of the book. So as you pointed out, Caroline, there's a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, twists and turns, uh, and, and it's, you know, set in a, the context of a fairly uh, typical legal thriller um, mm-hmm. that has, uh, you know, uh, I hope, a compelling storyline so that this issue, this theme of morality and artificial intelligence can be explored. Because actually, I mean, our, our judicial system is very complex. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot, there's a lot of ins and outs, and it's not always fair. I mean, that's, you know, because it's exactly one person's right. decision. Yeah, one person's decision can impact a whole lot of people. That you know, that's that's just the way it is. And that's life, man, but, absolutely. Paul's a corporate attorney, but he sure doesn't trust the judicial system when it comes to criminal. No. <laughs> yeah. No, Paul has. Um, Paul has had too much experience himself with understanding the limitations of uh, the justice system. And uh, rather than in a critical point in the book, rather than him turning himself over to the police and saying, I trust you in resolving this in a fair and, and equitable manner, and I uh, leave my, uh, you know, my, my own uh, fate in your hands. He hops in his car and runs for South Georgia to get away. <laughs> so wow. that that tells you what he thinks about yeah, yeah. Uh, the justice system. You're listening right. to Writers' Voices with Monica and Caroline, <laughs> and our guest today is Pat McKee, author of Ariel's Island. Now, the the kind of underlying court case that that you refer to in the part that you read. And that's kind of the um, the engine underneath all everything else that happens here is an intellectual property case. Why did you choose that field? Well, um, it overlaps um, with uh, a lot of contemporary um, issues that are interesting to people, and as you know. In this particular case, what I did was is I made um, the case turn on several uh, very valuable patents, and these patents were um, uh, to certain HIV drugs that had the potential to end the scourge of AIDS. And, of course, um, I thought that that would give... uh, you know, high drama to a court case if we had a uh, had some uh, drugs that would be potentially uh, able to end AIDS um, throughout the world. And I've, I've uh, used the analogy to um, Johanna Salk, who ended polio. And I had always found his um, uh, his example to be just remarkably inspiring. He gave, he, he could have become a multi-billionaire back in the 50s by creating uh, the polio vaccine, yet he gave it, uh, he created it and gave it to everyone for free so that the polio um, scourge could be eliminated. And I, I just, I found that to be so incredibly compelling and so in this particular case, the good guys in the in in our case 
uh, were going to make uh, the um, the vaccine that they came up with for um, ending HIV. They were going to make that free to everybody, and the bad guys came in, and they were going to try to take it and uh, make a lot of money out of it. So that mm-hmm. set up basic, uh, you know, dramatic tension for the case. And it kind of the case sort of turned on this one Supreme Court ruling. Was that an actual ruling, or was that something that that uh, you fictionalized for this purpose? No, it's an actual court, uh, Supreme Court case, Halo oh. Electronics. Oh, yes, wow. it's a real case. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, it really did uh, make a big change in um, intellectual property cases, and and I used that to dramatize, uh, you know, what happened in this particular case, and where people, uh, you know, people that don't uh, aren't in the you know legal profession, they hear of, um, you know, big cases and courts overruling courts and other things, and they feel like, well, that's the end of it. Well, it's not really. When a, a, a when the Supreme Court overrules a precedent, it sets dominoes tumbling, you know, on into infinity almost because of the people build their um, businesses, they build their legal strategies, they build all kinds of things based upon a, you know, an assumption as to how the law is going to be in the future, and when the Supreme Court or another court changes that, it's a it's a big deal. And oh it's yeah, ripple through mm-hmm. everything. It's interesting in in criminal law situations. Sometimes uh, rulings are are actually we had a case that I'm familiar with in the Iowa Supreme Court where a ruling was made um, to say that the felony murder rule was unconstitutional. Um, when the act that was the felony and the act that caused the death were the same act, that that you couldn't apply the felony murder rule to um, basically override the need to prove um, premeditation or intent. Mm-hmm. And right. but that ruling was rule. They specifically said it will not be made retroactive. And so uh-huh. there are people. There are probably at least a hundred inmates in Iowa who are in life for life without possibility of parole under a um, having been prosecuted under law later ruled unconstitutional how about that yeah, yeah. I mean that's pretty that's pretty striking I know yeah um, and and so the, the the pivotal decision Supreme Court decision which is mentioned in the you know second chapter in this in this book, um, was a real live uh, Supreme Court decision that changed um, a certain aspect of uh, intellectual property law, primarily what it would take to get in front of a jury to prove um, punitive damages, which in these kinds of cases, uh, intellectual property, when you're dealing with pharmaceuticals and things, you're, you're talking about billions of dollars. Oh, wow. wow. So anyway, I wanted the stakes to be really <laughs> high and make it interesting for you. So, Pat, I read that you are a member of the Atlanta Writers Group. How long has that group been going, and how does it work? Well, the Atlanta Writers Guild is over 100 years old. Um, It is a wonderful group, and they have been extraordinarily helpful to me. Um, One of the things that they put on is a... Uh, is a writer's conference, um, and in the writer's conference, they uh, bring together uh, folks like me, aspiring writers, and agents, and um, publishers, and uh, they let uh, uh, the aspiring writers, it's kind of like speed dating, um, you get about five minutes in front of an agent, or five minutes in front of a publisher, and you can make your pitch. And uh, they they'll take a look at uh, a couple of uh, chapters of your book and tell you if they think it's worthwhile. So that to me, in the past, had been extremely extremely helpful. As you know, 
it can be very um, uh, discouraging, if you will, to uh, get uh, you know publishers and agents uh, constantly telling you no thanks or not even answering your answering your inquiry. So if you can get in front of somebody and they can tell you, yeah, this 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 was a pretty good idea. Uh, I'd be interested in you know hearing from you. That that was just very helpful, very encouraging, and it's done a lot for um, many many writers. So I I I believe the Atlanta Writers Conference put on by the Atlanta Writers Guild is one of the the finest conferences I've been to. And you won an award from this guild. I believe. Yes, as a matter of of fact, yeah, as a matter of fact, one of the things that you can do um, is that you can present a a sample of your manuscript to uh, a publisher, uh, and, uh, you know, they will review it, and uh, I've won uh, two years in a row uh, the, the best manuscript sample. Uh, at the Atlanta Writers Conference, and that gave me the kind of the uh, you know the encouragement I needed to keep trying, even though uh, you know I couldn't find a a major publishing company to um, publish my book. I did ultimately find a um, an independent publisher, a uh, really fine group of folks, uh, uh, and the name of that publisher is Southern Fried Karma. It's out of Atlanta, and they publish uh, folks like me that uh, have not been able to make it with big publishers, but have an interesting story to tell. Wow. Uh, how many books do they publish a year? You know, I would, I would, you know, my guess is probably, you know, a half a dozen to a dozen. Uh, so they're a relatively small group, uh, and uh, Steve McCondichy is the um, the prime mover of Southern Pride Karma, and he's um, out looking for uh, you know interesting stories and interesting writers. So I would certainly encourage anybody to get in touch with uh, look up Southern Pride Karma. They have a nice website. Um, yeah, I'm and, looking at uh, it right now, and it says cultivating artistic voices of the new millennium with a southern accent. So I'm guessing you have to have a little bit of a southern spin, southern location or something. Um, it, it might help, yeah. <laughs> but but many, there. it seems like there are these small, independent, regional publishers spread across the United States, and they're really a good, a good home for a lot of writers. In Iowa, we have Ice Cube Press up in North Liberty, they probably do half a dozen to a dozen books a year as well. It's a very small team. But the quality of the books is very high. Well, I hope that you would agree that um, the, the production quality of uh, Ariel's Island is um, as good as, as any you'll see. Well, what do you think, Mom? I only got the digital version. I didn't get to see the hard copy. Oh yeah, it's uh, the, the cover is the cover is very uh, interesting. I mean, it's it's part of the page turner because you know what is that all about? No. <laughs> I think the cover is really um, fascinating. I'll, I'll just kind of describe it generally. It's it's a um, it's it's a stormy uh, sea with a pair of eyes that are staring out of out at you. And one of the things that I had um, hoped that we could do was echo um, one of the more famous uh, book covers that was ever done, and that was The Great Gatsby. And if you remember the eyes in The Great Gatsby, um, that co- book cover uh, is a true classic, and uh, I thought the eyes would be helpful to give that kind of mysterious feel that you got, uh, Caroline, in, in looking at the cover. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you have that uh, person swimming in between right. the eyes, and that you think, "Oh my goodness, what is going on?" Yeah, right. Well, good. I'm so glad. I and I, you know, I had nothing to do with that. That's part of the production team at um, Southern Fried Karma that came up with that book, uh, book cover. Now, did you end up seeing um, 
or having an editor, or excuse me, an agent? Did you end up having an agent, or did you go directly to the publisher yourself? I went directly to the publisher, and the publisher, Steve, had been uh, a writer who had uh, had the same experience that I did, and that is, is that people found his work good, but he never could get an agent to, to represent him. And so um, I went to Steve directly without an agent and said, here, I, I think you'll like this. And uh, he did. And I thank God that he had the, the uh, confidence in me uh, to uh, take on my book. From the time he took it on, did you work much with them in terms of editing, or was it pretty final before you gave it to them? That's a, a really good question. He had an extraordinarily fine um, concept editor, and he read the um, manuscript and suggested some extremely, extremely valuable changes. And like I said, I changed the beginning and the end, and as a result of his um, comments, uh, I, the, that's how the current beginning and the current ending um, uh, came about from his comments. So they were extremely helpful. It sounds like you are one of the are not one of these writers who it's like well if that's the way I wrote it I'm going to leave it that way but that you are open to feedback and editing which is actually very important if you want to be successfully published. Yeah, I I, I certainly um, I, I I I I feel strongly about my work but I also feel that there are other people out there who have uh, a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and uh, can be very, very helpful uh, in developing a strong uh, uh, book. So their, their, edit, their editing staff was uh, top, top notch. Now, let's go back to the book a little bit. There's a character that gets introduced um, a little ways in who really helps Paul a lot, a man named Gray. Right. Is he based on someone in real life? Well, um, yes, as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I will say that I, 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 in my experience, I have worked with, I, I was in the state attorney general's office, and I worked with a number of um, GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents. And uh, he's something of a composite of, some of the agents that I have met over the years, and they are, you know, uh, extremely interesting people. And what I wanted to convey with Agent Gray that um, no matter how um, rough uh, the package, how rough the exterior, inside was an extraordinarily capable person. In this particular instance, he's a graduate of uh, Georgia Tech in uh, uh, computer surveillance and has a master's degree from Vanderbilt in psychology. So he's not some dumb redneck li living out in the, uh, in the woods. He's a smart guy living out in the woods. He's a smart guy <laughs> living out in the woods, and he chose to do that. Right. 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 And a lot, you know, and there are a lot of smart people that do choose to live out in the woods, and yeah. uh, that's something very important for people to know. Yep. And he's and he's not fond of the feds. Is that no, he's not fond of the feds? <laughs> is that something you now, found as common in the GBI? I am not going to attribute that to the GBI. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't want either the FBI or the GBI to be coming down on me and saying, look, you, you've been uh, uh, saying bad things about it. No, I, I will say this. There are, there is um, uh, a little of interagency jealousy among all law enforcement groups that I have seen, you know, in my experience, that you have some people, you know, think, you know, this is my turf, and you don't need to get on my turf. And I think it's fair to say that there is some, um, um, I, I, I would say, jealousy um, as far as uh, various 
uh, agencies go. But that's as far as I'm going to go. <laughs> well, you certainly see that on TV in the movies. So I, I was just wondering if that was just a trope or if that if that was based on reality. And it sounds like I, it is in, based in, on reality. Yeah. In my <laughs> judgment, yes, it yeah. is based on reality for sure. Well, we are getting close to being out of time. Um, oh, no. Do you have any – I know the book is being released March 31st, and so yeah. we're recording that this before that date, but you may be listening to it after that date. And where will Ariel's Island be available? So Ariel's Island will be available on Amazon. As a matter of fact, um, you can pre-order. It, it is currently <laughs> currently available on Amazon uh, to pre-order. Right. So um, it is available, um, and I ask uh, all of your faithful lit- listeners to go out and get a copy of Ariel's Island and uh, enjoy it. It's a fun read. And it is. It's, it is. It's very exciting. And, really Mom, is. do you have some final words of wisdom for us today? <laughs> well, I had a couple of things. But uh, in this time of technology um, <clears throat> and the use of more various things like artificial intelligence, we have no way of knowing what the next thing will be. Just rem- remember that because it is new and exciting, it does not make it necessarily good for mankind. Amen. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. And thank you all for being with us today. And see you all next week on Writer's Voices. Thank you. Bye now.